Kentucky Update. We start with more news about our booming economy here in Kentucky. This week, we're announcing that general fund receipts for the fiscal year 2023 totaled $15.1 billion. I'm told this is the largest amount of revenue that Kentucky has ever seen in a fiscal year, uh, that it has never exceeded $15 billion. We can also announce that we believe when we close the, the books, which will happen here in just a few weeks, that we will have the largest budget surplus that we've ever seen, the largest revenue surplus. Here it looks like $1.4 billion. The final budget surplus will be known once the accounting records for expenditures are completed later this month. This will be the third consecutive year with a general fund budget surplus in excess of $1 billion. Road revenues totaled $1.75 billion. That's for the road fund. That's a 4.7% uh, increase over last year. And that's resulted in a revenue surplus in the road fund as well, this time of $32.3 million. Our state uh, budget director and my executive uh, cabinet secretary, John Hicks, uh, his report says that uh, this surplus is due to Kentucky's economic strength, uh, more jobs, higher wages and salaries, and another year of double digit growth in sales revenues and continued business profits. Put simple, we're booming. And this revenue figure shows how much we're booming at unprecedented levels. It's an exciting time with a lot of potential out there to grab a hold of and make sure we make this state everything we've always dreamed of, that we turn our brain drain into a brain gain, and we ensure that no matter how big our kids dream, they can chase those dreams right here in Kentucky. The $15.1 billion in revenues also incorporates six months of the 10% individual income tax rate cut that went to, into effect January 2023. In other words, we have cut taxes on our families, yet are having stronger revenues than ever, meaning that our economy, again, is booming. We continue to see our economy on fire all while lowering both income and property taxes for our families. Kentucky's economy continues to grow, and this week we have several great economic development projects to highlight. Since the start of my administration, we've announced more than 860 expansion or new location projects with more than $26 billion in new investment here in the Commonwealth. Right now, Kentucky has 57,000 more jobs that are filled than before the pandemic, meaning we've not only picked ourselves up, but we are marching forward at an incredible rate. We give a lot of thanks to that from companies that have been in Kentucky, have seen what we have to offer and choose to expand here when they could expand virtually anywhere. So on Tuesday, we announced that Hitachi Estimo Americas, uh, one of Kentucky's largest tier one automotive suppliers is expanding its Madison County operation with a $153 million investment that's creating 167 new high quality Kentucky jobs. The expansion brings the company's total Kentucky employment across its Harrodsburg and Berea facilities to more than 2,100 workers. The project will see company leaders invest in the current manufacturing operations in Berea to support improvements and renovations, including increased production lines and additional equipment. The investment will allow Hitachi to renovate over 100,000 square feet of space for additional manufacturing capabilities, and it comes in response to increased market demand and growth within the EV industry. Headquartered in Tokyo, Japan, Hitachi expanded into the U.S. market in the mid-1980s with its first factory in Kentucky. Today, the company serves as a global mega supplier to some of the largest vehicle manufacturers in the world and has more than 20 locations in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil. Manufacturing and the automotive sector have long been central to the Commonwealth's economy. And with the rapidly growing EV sector bringing high quality jobs and investment to our communities, we are setting up Kentucky for sustained success. I wanna thank uh, the company's leadership for their continued commitment to the Commonwealth now. I'd like to introduce Bart Lewis, VP of Sales, to say a few words on behalf of the company. Welcome. Thank you, Governor. We're grateful. Thank you. So thanks for the opportunity. Since 1985, Hitachi has been committed to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. As a native Kentuckian, 
and a 25-year Hitachi employee, I'm proud that this announcement of growth in the electrification products is a continuation of that commitment. As Governor said, Hitachi, with over 2,100 employees in Kentucky, remains a leader in the global automotive supply, with parts shipping to most automotive manufacturers in North America, as well as around the world. The automotive industry is in the midst of an exciting transition to electrification technology. As is clear from this announcement, Hitachi is well positioned. In 2021, we merged with three other companies to form Hitachi Ostimo, which stands for Advanced Sustainable Technologies for Mobility. We stand ever ready to meet this transition to electrification and believe this most recent growth in Berea is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. And it's great to see um, a Kentuckian serving in uh, such a prestigious role uh, in this company. Thank you to Hitachi for continuing to believe in us, for expanding, and feel free to continue to expand. Earlier today, uh, Harbor Steel and Supply, a distributor and manufacturer of fabricated products for the steel and aluminum industries, cut the ribbon on a new $8 million operation in Bowling Green, creating 25 new full-time jobs. Michigan-based Harbor Steel was founded in 1952 and has now become a complete metal service center for its customers with seven locations across the central United States. The company distributes and manufactures fabricated steel products and specializes in processed steel and plate for a variety of markets. Harbor Steel services include sheet and tube laser cutting, plasma cutting, flame cutting, saw cutting, forming and machining uh, of hot rolled and cold roll aluminum stainless steel. Harbor Steel also operates in Lexington where it employs 60 Kentuckians. Congratulations to Harbor Steel on this new location in Bowling Green. I look forward to them continuing to grow and what another great example of a company having had operations in Kentucky, knowing what we're capable of and choosing us for their expansion. That's not all for Warren County last week. We announced Southern Coil Solutions is locating a $27 million fully automated steel coil warehouse distribution and logistics center in Bowling Green that's going to create 30 new full-time jobs. Established earlier this year, Southern Coil Solutions is an automated storage warehousing company specializing in the handling of aluminum and steel coils. Southern Coil Solutions will locate on over nine acres in Warren County with construction beginning in the coming weeks. They're not waiting. And they look to be completed by December. The facility will be designed to ensure optimal safety, security, and efficiency through the storage and retrieval processes. This company is a great addition to our thriving metal sector, and it will create great jobs for Kentuckians and their families. I wanna thank the company for their belief in us, and we look forward to growing with them in the future. All right, company announcements aren't the only economic news we have to share this week. Kentucky has won yet another prestigious economic development award, bringing national attention to us and what's going on right here with our booming economy. I am proud to announce that industry publication, Area Development, has issued Kentucky its Gold Shovel Award for the second year in a row. Area Development's annual Gold Shovel Award recognizes states for achievements in attracting new business investment and new jobs. And so each year, Area Development only awards one gold shovel for uh, each of, of its categories of population. We fall within the states with a population of four to six million. And we won number one for economic development for their Gold Shovel Award, only one given in that category, winning it back to back, a state with just 4.4 million people for this category is pretty special. And once again, shows we are on the forefront of economic development nationally. It also named AESC, that's the Envision Project in Bowling Green, a top national manufacturing project. The AESC Electric Vehicle Battery Gigafactory in Bowling Green is helping Kentucky become a national leader in the fast growing EV sector. Remember, that is at the moment a $2 billion investment, over 2,000 new jobs. The recognition shows the rest of the country that Kentucky is the best place to do business. So on top of site selection, recognizing us number two in per capita economic development last year, number three 
in rural job growth, number five in their Prosperity Cups, number one in our region for the Prosperity Cup over Tennessee and Texas. We can add a Gold Shovel Award, number one in the country for states between four to six million people. That's a, a pretty special recognition for Kentucky, and everybody out there deserves credit. Whether you're in economic development state or local, wh whether you're rolling out the red carpet to people that are looking at, at potential sites, whether you're doing things in your community just to make it a better place to live or saying hi to that person from out of town that might be looking to locate, each and every one of you out there has a role in making this happen. And as Kentuckians, we should all be proud of it. We should all take ownership of it. And we should all make sure that it continues because now, if we've had our two best years of economic development back to back, hopefully in the midst of our third, you know, three good years of economic development can turn into decades of prosperity. And that's what we ought to want for our kids and for our grandkids. You know, we can collectively leave a legacy of more opportunity for those that come after us. And that's worth all of us working together to make happen. This is just one recognition of our efforts to date. Next, we have some news about um, a recognition or award that Kentucky has won in a, in a different area, but a very important one. Every year, Mental Health America collects data across all 50 states and releases their state rankings. They collect data based on how many adults and youth have mental health and addiction issues and how many have access to health coverage. We're proud to report that Kentucky is ranked number one in the area of adult mental health based on Mental Health America's rankings. These rankings show that we've been working hard in Kentucky to address a very challenging field, but being committed to getting it done. We prioritize families by extending Medicaid benefits to children and women who are pregnant or postpartum to support their mental and physical health. I've signed legislation to expand access to assisted outpatient treatment for folks that have severe mental illness. We have implemented a policy that allows peace officers and firefighters to take 48 hours of mental leave after being involved in a traumatic situation. We've created the Kentucky Judicial Mental Health Commission. I signed legislation to make telehealth more available to everyone. We supported mental health services to victims of natural disasters. We've trained our law enforcement officers on how to recognize and interact with folks in a mental health crisis. We've announced millions of dollars that'll go towards expanding school-based mental health resources. We signed legislation allowing students to take mental health days and our Lieutenant Governor has worked so hard through the Student Mental Health Initiative to make sure we're listening to the students and young people who are actually facing these challenges and responding appropriately. Folks, mental health care is health care, just as important as any form of physical health care. And I'm glad the work we've been doing is being noticed around the country. And this news of Kentucky's number one ranking in mental health couldn't come at a better time because this Sunday is the one year anniversary of the 988 suicide and crisis lifeline here in Kentucky. That was establishing a three digit number like 911, but designed to get you to people that can help you the most. People trained in mental health that will respond uh, to that emergency that you are facing. Since this free, confidential 24-7 line launched, we have seen a significant increase in call volume, text messages and chats, with a decrease in abandonment rates and speed to answer. Our latest data shows over 22,000 calls have been answered since last July. That's an increase of 22% compared to the prior 12-month period. That is good progress. Currently, 81% of all calls are answered in-state at an average rate of 27 seconds, which is five seconds faster than the national rate. There have been nearly 9,000 text messages and 9,000 online chats since the launch, and the volume steadily grows for these forms of communication uh, every year. We recently received a testimonial from a 988 center in Kentucky where a caller reported feeling overwhelmed with emotions and was actively suicidal. By the end of the call, the crisis counselor was able to guide the caller to a safer, calmer place. The same caller followed up with the crisis counselor to make sure they knew of their impact and the caller voiced that their life had been saved as a result. Folks, our mental health teams across the state are doing God's work, and now they are better connected and have an easier time communicating directly with someone without delay. I'm very proud of the work done in mental health these past few years in the Commonwealth. But maybe what I'm most proud of is the people who are willing to reach out. Now, 
what we didn't mention in going through that story is that caller had the courage to pick up the phone and to call someone and to hope that someone on the other line could help. Listen, let's remember we are going through all types of trauma in our lives. Much of it is more than our bodies or our minds are able to handle. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to reach out uh, for help. It's okay to get it tips or, or counseling to help you get through the hard times. People train uh, a, a good portion of their life. Go to school to help you uh, if you need it. And they are out there waiting for you. And to everyone who is feeling overwhelmed or in this place, know that you are loved. There are people out there that care about you, that support you. And anyone at this 988 line is ready to drop everything and help you in every way they can. To everybody working in mental health in Kentucky, thank you. Uh, great numbers that have come back on this one-year anniversary. Keep it up. There's a lot of people out there that can use your help. And thank you for willing to be do, for, to, to do it. All right. Um, this week, we learned that a uh, uh, candidate in one of our primaries for governor uh, had made and was making numerous blatantly racist and homophobic comments and statements, including uh, using the N-word. Representative Thomas Massey called him out, and Representative Thomas Massey was right. He was right to do so. There is no place for these types of comments in Kentucky. They are uh, horrific. Uh, they spur hatred and division, and they violate everything that my faith teaches me on Sunday, and I'm supposed to practice every other day of the week. I fully condemn each of these statements this individual made, and I call on every other elected official to do so. The way we root out hate and end it is to make sure that we call it out when it's there, no matter who is saying it that we give it no space and no oxygen. And every single individual out there in a leadership position fully condemns it. That's the very least we should do. That's what leadership requires. All right, on Monday, we also delivered some more great news when it comes to giving Kentuckians something that they have sought for a long time. We're talking about sports betting. This week, the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission unanimously approved emergency administrative regulations required to open sports betting. I immediately signed them, which means that Kentuckians may now make their first bet in 56 days. That's right. Sports betting will start in 56 days in the Commonwealth. The countdown is on. Sports betting will be here just in time for the NFL kickoff, tailgating, and the college football season. Uh, September 7th, which is when um, we will open in our retail locations, is the first regular season NFL game. It's also when two of our uh, state schools play each other in football. Murray State and Louisville is two days before Kentucky uh, plays EKU. Uh, it's two days before Western plays Houston Christian. Retail locations can open Thursday, September 7th, 2023, followed by mobile applications Thursday, September 28th. 2023. This was a monumental win for uh, Kentuckians. This is something that the vast majority has wanted so long, yet we hadn't been able to get to the General Assembly. I'm proud of the bipartisan effort of seeing people cross over, even folks that may say, I don't ever want to do this, but I recognize it's what my constituents want, and it's my duty to carry out their will um, and to serve them as their state representative or Senator. We believe that we will see at least $23 million of new revenue that instead of going to Indiana or Tennessee or a surrounding state, will stay right here in Kentucky. And as people will see on September 7th, there have been uh, uh, beautiful areas built out at our tracks that are going to be tourist destinations, whether that's for the first round of the NCAA basketball tournament or uh, other days where, where people are looking for that entertainment uh, option. Uh, these are investments that are going to help us build a better Kentucky, and I want to thank the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Listen, we have done this with significant speed, and it's thanks to a lot of hard work from the commission as well as the Public Protection Cabinet, and I believe they're getting it right. Now, the commission is accepting applications right now from Kentucky's licensed horse racing facilities for retail sports books at their main locations or licensed satellite locations. The locations that are eligible 
are on the screen uh, right now. Some of them will apply and likely be open on September the 7th. Some of them are still under construction. The ones that are under construction will, will need to have a, a permanent facility to open the retail location, but will on September 28th be able to open an online uh, partnership uh, when those launch that day. So today I'm gonna take another step to support sports betting by signing an executive order that creates a sport Sports Wagering Advisory Council. See, right now, the commission has you know, traditionally been about regulation of the horse industry. And it, it, in many ways, is the perfect area to house sports betting. But we recognize that having others that have uh, knowledge and direct knowledge of the sports betting industry can provide good advice to the commission. This is about having some additional voices at the table uh, that will be able to provide uh, different thoughts on everything from uh, regulation uh, to uh, potential uh, changes in how things are done to how we carry out uh, the day to day. We'll be naming members of the council, which will include the Public Protection Cabinet Secretary, three members and an employee of the Horse Racing Commission, and two at-large members. This is gonna help us make sure that we have the very best sports betting system possible and that we get this right. So with that, I'm going to sign the EO. All right, we are one step closer, 56 days, everybody. Start uh, thinking about what you want that first one to be. And it's gonna be an exciting time here in the Commonwealth, excited to keep our dollars at home where they can benefit our pensions, where they can help with problem gambling and otherwise meet needs of Kentuckians here in Kentucky. Next, we get to announce some pretty incredible organizations that are again, doing God's work and they're getting dollars from our Veterans Program Trust Fund. This fund is overseen by a board of directors and more information about applications and deadlines can be found on the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs website. Today, we get to announce that the fund has recently approved over $175,000 to support our heroic veterans. First, $25,000 is going to the Kentucky Historical Society for their exhibit featuring Kentucky's women veterans telling their stories through objects, images, documents, and oral histories. Be sure to stop by Frankfurt and see this incredible exhibit honoring the story of women's veterans whose stories haven't been told. The amount they should be, that's something we're working on that we should be able to remedy and honor all of our veterans. $6,000 is going to support the Warrior Battalion, an organization in Louisville that provides veterans with financial assistance for food, healthcare, shelter, and other emergency needs. $34,000 is going to the Kentucky Minutemen Relief Fund. This organization assists airmen and soldiers of the Kentucky National Guard with housing, transportation, medical expenses, child care, and more. $13,800 for the National Association for Black Veterans to support their Week of Valor events. $50,000 is going to Honor Flight Kentucky to support their mission of providing veterans with flights to Washington, D.C. to visit various war memorials built in their honor and that honor their service and their sacrifice. $28,000 is going to Service Dog Solutions to train four service dogs over the next year that'll be placed with four veterans in need. $15,000 is going to Horse Sensing, a nonprofit in Shelby County to support veterans who live on site while completing the organization's equine grooming program. Finally, about $4,000 is going to the Disabled American Veterans Chapter Three for the purchase of uniforms for funeral details, posting of colors, and other veterans events. In Kentucky, we support our veterans. We look for all the ways to honor them and when they're struggling, how we can help, how we can help stabilize, but more importantly than that, how we can pay them back for their service by ensuring a good life, not just for them, but for their kids and for their grandkids. All right, weather today. <laughs> We've had a lot of severe weather over the past years. Today, people need to remain weather aware. An approaching cold front will bring increased chances for showers and storms this afternoon and evening with the possibility of storms becoming strong to severe. 
Heavy rainfall, damaging winds, lightning, and large hail are expected or possible. More weather is expected Sunday morning through Saturday evening with showers and thunderstorms. All right, in Eastern Kentucky, we now have 80 households sheltering in Eastern Kentucky that are in 83 travel trailers provided through the program. That's three fewer families. That's three families that have found a more permanent option. Three fewer trailers. 76 trailers are at commercial locations, while seven are on private property. 302 families have now been able to transition out. And that's actually pretty similar to some numbers of houses that are now habitable that we will see in a minute. Debris removal efforts on private property is nearly complete in five counties. Remember, we had the major debris removal effort, and then we launched a second to go on private property where people hadn't been able to get it to the road. This work was to clear debris that couldn't be moved to the side of the road for pickup and is performed at the request of property owners. Operations have concluded in Knott and Pike counties. The contractors are on track to be finished in all five counties by July the 28th. As of yesterday, they had removed, and this is just in the private property debris removal program, the second smaller program, 5,673 tons of debris. That's from 258 properties in those five counties. That is on top of the larger program that has removed 409,000 tons from roadsides and 600 miles of creeks and streams. That was the first major portion. An update on bridges, 46 have been replaced, 35 have been repaired, work is ongoing. High ground communities, a lot of great updates. To date, we've announced three high ground communities. That's Olive Branch in Knott County, Skyview in Perry County, and recently the cottages at Thompson Branch in Letcher County. Building on high ground is a vision uh, for a long-term secure Eastern Kentucky. Remember, this is probably the toughest rebuild that the United States has ever seen because we can't rebuild in place. We have to move people from the floodplain where they are in danger to higher ground. That means building entirely new communities, but at the same time being able to re-envision what a neighborhood in Eastern Kentucky looks like and the services that can be provided. Housing remains the number one need in the area. Each of these high ground communities is an opportunity to provide safe, affordable housing outside the floodplain, including much needed infrastructure and community buildings that can uplift the entire area. So let's start with Olive Branch. That's located in the community of Talcum in Knott County near the Perry County line. In partnership with the Adams family, it includes at least 75 acres that are going to be able to accommodate up to 150 new homes and there is an opportunity at the property for future expansion. Future plans also include community buildings and a space for a new elementary school. The project brings big improvements to local infrastructure, which will benefit not just this community, but a whole lot of the surrounding water systems that have been challenged for a long time. I think there's three separate water systems that this project is going to make improvements in their service as well. Skyview is located in Perry County, just five miles from downtown Hazard. That's in partnership with the Eisen family. The project includes 50 acres of land close to schools, shopping centers, and the Hazard Regional Medical Center. At least 90 homes are planned along with infrastructure. Work will begin soon on a bridge to the property that will allow infrastructure work to begin. More details on that bridge are coming really soon. And then that video you are watching. Less than two weeks ago, we announced a third property for high ground building. That is in Letcher County near Whitesburg. That community is the Cottages at Thompson Branch. It is a first of its kind partnership with FEMA. And we've actually, um, it's a partnership between FEMA, the state and the county, every single one having a portion of it. Uh, this project will be 10 homes, uh, uh, 10 homes for 10 families on four acres of buildable land. It's a, 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 again, a first of its kind project where FEMA will come in and will build what they call temporary housing that the state will then make improvements to so that it can be long-term permanent housing. There's been a lot of planning on this and a lot of flexibility from FEMA, from the county, everybody working together for months. This has never been done before, and we are very excited about how it's being done. Uh, once completed, these high, three high ground communities will be home to at least 250 families, and there is still more to come. 
All right, let's look at the, where we are right now. So Fahi is a really great partner, and they have really been in the lead of trying to uh, bring together numbers of homes in eastern Kentucky that have been worked on that are uh, now habitable through multiple uh, organizations. They have been a leader and a collaborator that's helped everybody work together. Uh, let's show you their newest numbers. All right, that first column you see are homes that weren't habitable before the flood that people have now been able to move back into. That's 136 homes that had to be mucked out. Uh, they may have had a lot of mud or other issues, but now uh, are safe to move back in. It's 154 rehabs that took coming in and doing different work to get them back up. And there are 21 completed new homes. Uh, what that means is there are at least, and these are just the numbers we track, 311 homes that uh, either you couldn't live in or hadn't been built in Eastern Kentucky that uh, since the flood are up and operational. Then you look at 67 homes that are in process uh, right now, uh, in, all in different phases, but all hopefully soon to be completed with a family to move into. And then on the bottom, you see we have 130 additional new homes and 123 rehab projects pending construction or application approval. And all this is before the high ground communities we are talking about. All this is before the 300 plus million dollars of CDBG DR funds that are going to open up after we get some environmental surveys done. So this is showing you the work that's been done, even while we've had to grind it out this last year, even when some funding and land hasn't been available. This is being done by a ton of different organizations. All of them deserve credit from groups like FAHI and, and HOMES uh, to church groups that are out there, to people who are just giving their time. Uh, these are Kentuckians and people from outside of Kentucky coming in on mission trips and others. Uh, rebuilding the area, these homes are all in safe places uh, that are up here and knowing that a whole lot more families were going to have to move. And it can be hard, move from, from ground their families may have lived on for generations, but to a safer more permanent homes. So I want to thank Jim King and the entire FAHI team, along with, again, Housing Development Alliance, Homes Inc., and so many more for their work. All right. And finally, this week, we are recognizing a pretty incredible Team Kentucky All-Star. So last week, there was a, a family on a trip to Natural Bridge. And sadly, a young boy lost control of his bike and rode off a 15-foot cliff into a creek. But thanks to the quick action, of Kentucky Transportation Cabinet employee Keith Rogers. 10-year-old uh, Andrew is alive today and with his family. Keith was nearby eating his lunch when the incident occurred. He pulled the young boy out of the creek and he administered first aid until he could be taken to the hospital. Keith's actions didn't stop there. He later entered the creek to go get that kid's bicycle and he delivered it to the families. Andrew's mother, Jennifer, said that if Keith was not there, she's not sure her son would have made it out of the creek. Keith bravely jumped to action to save a child's life, and we are forever grateful for him. So this week, we are naming Keith Rogers, one uh, of our finest in Team Kentucky, our Team Kentucky All-Star. Okay, with that, I think we have four journalists here with us and two on the line. We'll start with Tom Latek. Next week, of course, is the anniversary of the flood. Um, besides housing, which you mentioned, what are some of the other things yet to be accomplished? And what have we learned from this that could mitigate future floods in the area? So we are coming up on the one year anniversary of the worst flooding event uh, in our history. Uh, there is a lot to celebrate in terms of those housing, in terms of the bridges uh, rebuild in terms of work on the water and wastewater systems we've done, but there is so much work to be done. Remember, just looking at water and wastewater, we believe there's over a billion dollars worth of damage, and uh, that takes time and funding uh, that we are bringing to the table, but it takes time to get it fully repaired. And, and the work um, has to always be moving forward. You know, we just made uh, announcements in Jackson. They had a senior living uh, <clears throat> facility where the elevator was powered at the bottom and the flooding took out all of, of the mechanical with that. We were just able to award funding through ARC, Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, to not only repair that elevator and fix two of the ground floor apartments, but to move the mechanical, the elevator to the top. So when we talk about lessons learned, one is we gotta move people out of the floodplain. They should never have to go through this um, again. I think number two is resiliency. 
You know, you look at the new bridges we're building and this same flood could happen and they would hold up. We got to make sure that everything we are building now uh, can withstand uh, more and more severe weather events. Um, and I'm proud of the work our transportation cabinet and others are doing uh, to, to, to make that happen. Uh, certainly, we, we learned a lot between the tornadoes and the floods about temporary housing, uh, but there's still uh, more that we can and learn here. Um, there's still uh, ways that we can improve on providing services in the immediate aftermath. Uh, though I believe that by the end, we had more people getting those FEMA benefits based on help we could put around them and help push them through than we've ever seen after one of those. Uh, we have learned that we have the most incredible National Guard in the country, an amazing Kentucky State Police and first responders um, that I think had the best 24 to 48 hour response in terms of saved lives of anything I've, I've ever uh, read about or, or heard about. Um, so a lot of lessons learned, a whole lot of it's about caring about each other, but then the commitment to making sure that we don't stop until the job is done. And, and that's gonna take years, that's plural. We're at one year and we've made some progress. Now we're gonna see a lot more this next year. You know, once we finish what are called NEPA uh, surveys required by the federal government to spend that disaster relief fund, the 300 million in the West and the and the East and, and, and the dollars in the West and Breathitt County, which qualified, because of the flood in 2021. Uh, once those are complete, that opens up a huge amount of money for housing and other infrastructure. So we will see the uh, pace continue to increase. Carolina. Uh, Governor, on the bridges from arts, are you troubled by the fact that the words and terms were even used? And what do you have to tell individuals that may be considering participating in events associated with well, I'm very troubled that someone who was a uh, candidate for governor you know, in debates uh, has gone on multiple tirades with uh, espousing uh, racism and homophobia. It's just wrong. And people shouldn't associate with the person that does that. And people shouldn't go to their events. When someone is showing you that they're a racist, you ought to condemn it. And you ought to not participate in events with them. You ought to not acknowledge them. You ought to condemn them. And that ought to be a pretty easy call for anyone in public service. Joe. Thanks. Um, regarding uh, the report last week that there are kids under care of the state who are sleeping at the cabinet for health and family services mm -hmm. offices in Louisville. Uh, regarding that, how many other or what are the other counties and cities where there are similar kids under care of the state who are also sleeping in offices or have slept in offices of the cabinet this year? And do you find this situation acceptable? Well, let me get you numbers from other counties. I don't have those in front of me. Uh, listen, every child deserves a forever home. I mean, as a dad, I believe every child is a child of God that deserves a forever home. And every child ought to be free of abuse and neglect. Sadly, we live in a tough world where many of the kids that come under the state's care have uh, been abused in horrific ways have undergone trauma that most of us uh, can't imagine. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's then the responsibility of the state to do everything uh, that it can. Uh, I don't want a single child to have to spend a single night in an office building. It is important though to know that you know, the world we live in is tough and complicated and these social workers are doing their very best and they face at least two difficult issues that sometimes result in these very short-term stays. Uh, the first is just a timing. Sometimes kids are removed very late at night uh, from a home or where they're staying, and it's really challenging to get them into a uh, another home or area because you also have to see what their needs are and potentially some of the trauma they've been through to know what the appropriate place to put them in is. And remember when we're talking about um, one of these children staying a night in an office building, there's a social worker staying there with them too that are away from their family. This isn't something they want to do. It's either for timing or the next reason that I'll talk about. It's the best option they have available to them at the time. And it's an awful option. The second is that sadly, some of the kids that that come under, under our protection have been through such horrific trauma um, that they end up exhibiting uh, violence towards staff members, uh, sexual aggression. And so we have to be very careful 
about placing them because we don't want to put other kids in the foster care system uh, in, in danger. Uh, so listen, I believe that each of our social workers always tries to find a placement that is not the LNN building or, or another one. Uh, when we look at steps that we're taking, you know, we added $41 million uh, to providers out there, uh, specifically asking for more services and placements for uh, those in, in need of the most care. But the other thing we need is we need foster parents willing to take the toughest of the tough cases. We need foster parents willing to take older kids, especially uh, teenagers as well. Do I believe it's acceptable? No. Do I believe that our social workers are trying their very best in these situations? Uh, yes. And we'll work with anyone, especially those that want to provide more services to try to make sure that you know, no child ever has to spend one of those nights. Sure. Uh, is Brooklawn going to open back up or is it open back up? I know it's some of the issue in Louisville. Right. Brooklawn is open to some services uh, right now. We were able to uh, begin uh, placing kids that were um, outside of the program uh, from the program that resulted in the fatality. Uh, Lauren. I wanted to follow up, Governor, and thank you with what Joe said. Um, the governor, um, well, you are the governor. Um, earlier today, the mayor said he was going to have a conversation with you this afternoon. Sure. He said it is a state problem, but the fact that he's trying to get on board, yeah. this is not specific to your problem, not so possibly his uh, CFS. What are you guys going to talk about? Yeah, well, look, we, too. yeah, we, we, as parents or as responsible adults, we all want every child to have a, a safe place. Again, we live in a tough world where some of these kids have been through uh, unspeakable trauma and, and sadly the impact that it has had on them can result in, in behavior that makes it more challenging to place them. That means we need to look for new providers, providers that will expand their services to um, uh, ensure uh, that, that we have a place uh, for them. Uh, we need um, more options uh, about, you know, the, the one night or the two night stay if someone is removed from a house uh, later. But, but I think what we all have to recognize is as long as there's this level of abuse and neglect, we're going to have these challenges, right? It's not a, a magic wand that we wave that just means there's a place for everybody to go. It's, it's a battle we do every day to make sure kids aren't neglected or abused in the first place. I mean, the earlier that we can be involved with families where this might happen, uh, prevent them from uh, the, the challenges that we see. I believe that early intervention um, is working right now. We have fewer kids in foster care today than two years ago. It's ticking up a little bit right now, um, but I believe some of those are, are, are working. So I, I don't want to take away from the fact that we don't want any child staying uh, in an office building, unless it's the safest place for them for that short period of time. But our goal should be to eliminate the abuse and the neglect that that results in them coming into the system in the first place. And it was just last month when you allocated that $41.5 million to support the state's foster care children. Is there more money? Is this a problem? We could throw more money at it? Or do you simply need families to step up yeah. and find room in their homes? Well, listen, uh, more funding is always helpful, but it's never the full answer. That $41 million ought to help, um, but there's likely more that's going to be needed in the future because, again, think about the therapies and the help that some of these kids need through no fault of their own. You know, the world has been awful to them, and trying to get them in a better place takes really talented, trained individuals with significant therapy uh, over time. And so we ought to want to have that system that is there for each and every one of them. Yes, that's a challenge to have in place, but it's a goal we can continue to strive for. But we do need more foster parents willing to take the tough cases and willing to take uh, older, mainly teenage uh, foster kids. Those are children of God, too, that need their forever home just as much as anybody else. All right, we have Karen Zarr on from WUKY. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Rachel. Fayette County Public Schools is working towards having a full-time nurse in each school. Is this something that you would mm -hmm. like to see as an earmarked position within the state budget, uh, especially it's not just for the physical needs, but the mental needs of the students? Thank you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my goodness, we've seen in the last three years, um, how amazing our nurses here in Kentucky are, uh, how heroic, 
how selfless, uh, how much they care, willing to risk their own health and safety to be there for others. And uh, listen, I, I know nurses um, that are in my son and daughter's school, and I know what they bring uh, to that middle school, and I know how important they are in the students' uh, lives. You now, this is something where you know healthcare is a universal right. I mean, it's a basic right, uh, basic human right that that everybody uh, should should have, and and having it there in schools for our kids from from even physical ailments to uh, mental challenges, I think is a, a good idea. Uh, John Cheeves, Herald Leader. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Attorney General Cameron announced his uh, public safety plan. He had some criticism for the parole board, um, and I'm not sure if I'd heard this recently, but he'd said he wants to change how the parole board operates. He wants to raise the threshold for release of prisoners, and he wants the governor to be able to remove members at will rather than have them be appointed to staggered terms and serve out their terms. He says that the parole board in recent years has attempted to release uh, some dangerous, violent criminals. Uh, have you been hearing complaints about the parole board? Has your justice secretary, have people been bringing uh, their concerns to you about particular cases or, or the way the board has been operating? Uh, thank you, sir. Well, certainly any time that uh, someone on, on parole ends up harming someone in the public, uh, it's a tragedy. And you definitely hear in those individual cases, and you can understand hearing from families how they wish that individual uh, had not been uh, paroled. Now, we have not been approached, or I have not been approached by, by groups about any type of structured reform. And John, we certainly ought to be careful um, about you know, how much authority a governor has versus staggered terms, because look at what Matt Bevan did in terms of pardons and could have done that on the parole board as well if he was able to remove people at will. And it'd be nice for an attorney general to have investigated those pardons, which allowed rapists and murderers to walk free, to put those families in danger, who's now talking about uh, this parole board. But I'm always willing uh, to look at different changes if I believe that it improves public safety. We certainly tried to make appointments, including an appointment from the Fraternal Order of Police uh, to the parole board to make sure that we have a lot of voices uh, that are heard. You know, as we back out of that into the broader context, we do have to look at how much space we have in our, our jails and in our prisons and make sure that the people we are sending to jail and prison are dangerous. That's like the individuals we are talking about and not just people that we are, are, are mad at. We need to make sure that those dealing drugs, those committing violent crimes um, do go to jail, uh, do go to prison and do serve uh, their time. Uh, all right, that is this week's Team Kentucky Update. We will be back next Thursday. Thank you all.